Exactly. Get as far as you want. But you exactly. Got to put it in the hole. Yeah. My son played. I swear his swing and his drive with D one and his short game was terrible. <laughs> oh my god! You could just see the cut. They loved him. He's a great kid and everything. I said, "You have the jeans backwards. We're terrible at the job." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't have that small, but I was like, I wanted to make sure it was, but we're still good. Hello there, welcome. Hi, Good to see you. Good, everyone. Good. 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 Hi, Warren. How are you? Great to see you. Hi, How are you? Great to see you. Hello, Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How you doing? How are you? Great to see you. Thanks for coming. The boat's still hanging in the, in the boathouse. 
I don't know when I'm going to learn how to do that. I, I kind of learned, but it's really my daughter. So we'll figure it out. Hello, well, sir. Just be warned, I'm going to use that in the springtime with the girls. That sounds fair. I'll tell my wife that. <laughs> it, did, did a set of oars come down with that, or is that yours still at your house? Sorry, my house. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't need them. I just, uh, I just try to keep track of what's Yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're definitely a threat. In my garage, I move them out of the way once a week. Yeah. <laughs> Like I had to do with every time I'd mow the lawn, I'd have to move the shell. I took care of that for you. <laughs> Is your daughter still want to sell it? Um, uh, the reason I asked, yeah. I'll just I'll just tell the girl that I want it it's for sale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so if anybody wants to wants to buy it, yeah, well. Uh, it was all refurbished. Hasn't been used since well, refurbished. Olivia Mello had expressed an interest in buying a boat, uh, but then she never followed up on it. So I'm supposed to say, well, she's a senior this year. This be the last year. She likes to go. Last year she had some uh, medical issues. Yeah, she had some eating problems. Uh, she had. I'm not sure if it was a chemical imbalance. Or she had some physical difficulty in gaining weight for no apparent reason. Yeah. Um, but she, her parents are getting divorced. You know, that, that, that'll, that'll blow off almost anybody. Play on music and match will be back. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Our neighbor in the Who was returning it was. She's got a couple of friends who signed up. She says we're signing up. Yeah, we had a couple of new girls. So she uh, is doing the play and dance. And she told her, do it. Do what you can. It'll be okay. Uh, that's my only complaint about this place is that you know, these kids do it so much. Uh, well, the play is over at Thanksgiving. Why not? Yeah, so they're going to be good. But you know, the. the for some reason, the plate people seem to feel like they trump everything. Well, I you know? think it's just the timing of it. <laughs> it's, uh, the timing of I mean, it. Wait a minute. What about us? Yeah. Uh, okay. How have you been? Have you had a good summer? Well, we have a house in Maine, so I'm up there. And I'm up there when the weather is good. And I, I get to do things I like to do, like sail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please don't. Yeah, I'm going to get to Gabrielle. There is not the same one that I had uh, a couple of years ago. Well, maybe it was. Um, 
They, uh, it always abuses me because some of, some of these girls come in and they say, well, I'm not very you know, competitive, but they, you know, they, <laughs> they still fight like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Morgan is excited. She's ready to go. I don't know if she's excited that Cruz coming back or it gives her out for dance so she doesn't go oh. to dance. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. We're taking her to Paris um, at Thanksgiving to look at a school over there for eighth grade. Yeah. And they crew on the Seine. Yeah. So we're going to check that out too. Well, we had, we had a lot of fun last year with the singles. Uh, yeah, which, and I don't feel which, like they do like multi. Well, I mean, quite well, quite frankly, uh, you know, the, what I call the little joints uh, are great training. Yeah. Uh, because it's all you, and you can, yeah. you can feel what's wrong. Right. Yep. You know, if you pay attention, and they you know, they'll, they'll understand the mechanics. Uh, but it gives me the option now. With in the past years, it's been. Uh, a little awkward because we had like five girls and six girls. And you know, it's, it's and it takes time. But frankly, it's not, I don't consider it to be outrageously dangerous, but you enhance the opportunity. Right, right. Yeah. The opportunity for people to go. My friend. I'll see you um, next week sometime. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you. Green light, green light. Well, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today. Uh, this will be the third time that I've heard Mr. McBeth talk. He had the opportunity at 11 o'clock this morning to talk with our upper school student body and faculty staff, and then at 1 o'clock this afternoon with our middle school students. Um, and really did a, a tremendous job of sharing his message. And so tonight is um, that same opportunity to share that message with you all. And when Bill and I started talking a few months ago, it became very clear from the get-go that, oh, this is someone that I want to bring in to share his message with our community. I think it reaffirms a lot of things that we already do, but he also challenged our students to really think about who they are, what type of life they want to live, and then, you know, kind of utilizing his mindset system of this is how you can go um, about getting to that type of life that you're, that you're looking to live. Um, so Bill is uh, the author of an upcoming book called mm -hmm. Winning with Class, where he had the opportunity to interview over 75 sports professionals um, at the top end from a variety of different sports. And, um, you know, through that experience, I think had a lot to take away and a lot to share. And so that's where, where we are today. So um, without further ado, I'm excited to present Mr. Bill McBeth. All right, Bill. All right. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a fantastic day. Um, it even started last night. Uh, Paul was so gracious, um, taking me out to dinner with the coaches and I uh, got to know them a little bit. Um, like Clay, Megan, Paul, the whole staff. It, it's truly clear and refreshing to see how much he embraced what I was trying to pitch. Um, and like I told your kids uh, today, they're really lucky to be here. Um, to, and it has nothing to do with bringing Bill McBeth to them, but it has to do with the priority with which he brought and embraced and jumped on my message to bring to them. So um, everybody's really lucky to have this place. It, it's not normal, I can tell you that, from shopping this all over the country, really. Um, 
this is the place that embraced it the most. Uh, to have three talks in one day that he pushed and wanted to do uh, to really immerse it in the community is so special. I really much appreciate it. So thank you very much. You guys have been amazing to me. Um, so I'll just go through what I talked to your kids about today and show you what kind of messages I'm trying to get through to them. Um, I tell them it's a life talk. Um, all of my interviews, the 75, 80 interviews I did were sports context, sports related, um, athletes, coaches, sports psychologists, um, you name it. Um, so they had a sports context, but it was all really about putting winning with class principles and priority and vision and virtues together with a solid list of priorities for life. And, and so it's really a life talk. And, and they really took it well. The eye contact was amazing. Uh, we did this, I do this thing where I ask them to clap three times if they're paying attention. We do that sporadically, and those claps were right on. Um, so I really feel like I'm preaching to the choir with this group. <laughs> um, but it's really refreshing to see. So um, again, this is an overall view of what I'm here to do. Um, again, a life talk. And to put it in their sports context, we talked about playing offense and defense in life. Okay, so offense being, let's pursue your best version of you. Let's pursue your best life and do that with confidence and humility. And then we talk on defense. Let's, let's try to boldly fight through life's challenges because they're going to come. And they're going to come when they don't expect it. And the key to my thing, my system is, I want them to have a go-to, something inside them. And really, it, it builds up to be kind of a journal, a living, breathing journal that they keep with them really for the rest of their lives. But it's the one, two, four at the bottom that's meant to support their ability to play offense and defense in life. So that's the big picture of what we started to do. Um, here's the one, two, four, and I told them it's not because I can't count. It really is one, two, four. Um, I didn't skip anything. Um, uh, and I know Paul's got some uh, messages that involve some other numbers, so I apologize if you see some of their mantras with other numbers involved. But we're on the same page in terms of making daily progress and uh, hope to not confuse anybody. But the one stands for one life, and we try to get them to think of perspective and big picture things. And what does your one life look like starting today with the decisions you make every day? Um, try to get them out of that tunnel vision of just get through the day or living small just think of big picture big life and how does this day add up to my life in general and is it going to be one that i'm proud of uh, the two questions we go over two questions that you should ask in building that one life to continually figure out where you are and where you're headed and then there's four steps i put together to building a winning with class mindset um, so that's the one two four uh, so in general like we just discussed one life try to get them to, to talk about yeah there's a sense of urgency you know, they, I always ask them, what, what, is, what do you think of when you hear one life? And, and they all said YOLO, um, you only live once. So that was very common, very quick answer. Uh, but, you know, kind of to the first point of sense of urgency, you know, you, you got one ch chance of this day and, and no more. Uh, but at the same time, balance with the fact that we're all human. So as soon as you know that we, we have that one thing in common, that we're human, perfection is out the door. So that kind of goes towards that angle. You know, one of the girls uh, said uh, one of the challenges she's facing when we talked about playing defense in life was getting to college, getting to college, and all the pressure they put on themselves these days. I've seen it with my own kids. Um, so the teacher said they've never seen it in this era as, as built up as it is. They put the pressure on themselves. And you try to nail down it's really about progress. Are you making progress? Are you doing well? You're going to have good days, bad days, and other days. And I told her, I said, that perfect college plan is not going to work perfectly. So just breathe and make progress. Um, and then finally, are you living in line with your, your principles and priorities and values? Uh, so that's those are the kinds of things we talk about, uh, big picture talking about one life. Uh, and try to blend in some of the stories. that They really like it when I put some of these principles in line with the stories from the interviews I had. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney was one of my favorites. Um, and I tell them, you know, if you want a great book to read uh, while you're waiting for mine to come out, uh, Fly Into the Wind is an amazing life book. Um, this guy looked at his, his dad when he was uh, 12 years old playing golf and said, I want to be a fighter pilot at a PGA pro club. And that's exactly what he did. It turns out he's the only one in the country to do it. Um, but he also went on to found 
Fold the Ladder, which is, you might see that in the news. And um, they raise uh, educational scholarships for children of those who are injured or lost on the field of battle. And he's raised to date about 35,000 scholarships uh, since 2007, I think. So, pretty amazing guy. Um, but he played golf at Kansas. And his, one of his professors walked into the class and just wrote this this word on the board and, and kind of let it stew for a little bit and asked the, the students if they knew what it meant and got a lot of silence. But he referenced the fact that, in his mind, it was the most powerful word in the English dictionary that's the power to choose. And so, we make this point to the kids. This one life is yours. So every day you get to choose what it's going to be like. And the second half, and that's the beautiful, the good part is it's yours. And you're the you're the author of your book, you're the director of your own movie. But along with that, you gotta realize that every decision you make adds up to the legacy of your life. So at the end, you're gonna see what you put together with those decisions. So those are the main points we made there. <clears throat> Let me go into the two questions. And the, and the first question. And really, all of this is really simple. I'm not going to blow anybody's minds with, with great, crazy, intelligent stuff here. Um, my main point is to take basic, solid things and put them into a system that will stick because they apply their lives to it. Um, so it's looking in the mirror. What do you think when you look in the mirror? And we talk about, you know, and some of the kids got funny. The, the middle schools got funny. That, you know, I'm really, I'm beautiful. I said, what do you think when you, when you look in the mirror? I'm beautiful. I'm gorgeous. I'm cool. I'm fast. Um, but they got it in general. It's really about looking at that total package of a person. You know, it's not about looks. And I told, I told them too. I'm thinking about doing a podcast, and the main reason I'm thinking about doing a podcast is because I got to get a great face for radio. Um, <laughs> so it's not about the physical. It's about this whole package of a person that you put together, and you like what you see, and you'll know. And, and talk about your friends are going to tell you things you like to hear. You know, your enemies or critics are going to tell you things you don't like. Well, you get to have that one-on-one -on -one with that person in the mirror. There's no better way for self-awareness in my mind than to look in that mirror and say, do I feel good about what I'm seeing? Um, so those are the kinds of things we, we talked about there. Candace Parker was one of my uh, interviews, and it fit in perfectly. I actually came up with the one, two, four after I interviewed her. But this is her answer. When I do the interviews, I would talk about what's winning with class to you, and how do you define it, and how do you apply it. But I'd also have the, the follow-up question was, well, why? Why are we doing this? Why is it important? And why don't you just win? Why don't you just dominate? Go get the trophy, right? And this is her answer. But fittingly enough, is you do it for yourself so you can look that person in the mirror. Um, and they like to hear that because she just won her second WNBA championship last weekend. Um, question two is, where is that package of a person heading? So you take that all the thing you liked or didn't like, and then are you on a path of progress or not? And again, we emphasize that it's not about perfection. It's just about making progress. And this is in line with what Paul's doing, with making progress on a daily basis and, and, and just doing a little bit at a time. But we talk about also um, a lot of times when they get down or defeated or stuck, it's because they don't have any anything going on in terms of hope, future, or progress. Um, that gets to all of us. That's for everybody. Um, so we try to get them to think of what's your path of progress. Um, and again, throw perfection out the door. Um, it's another story we told. Um, it may have been at home a little bit more with middle schoolers because uh, Tony Gonzalez, obviously a Hall of Fame uh, tight end and now CBS broadcaster for the NFL uh, show that they have, but he had a bully. So he, I was surprised to hear him tell me a bully story that he was bullied in eighth grade. Um, it sounds crazy, 6'6", six, six, just physical specimen, but uh, he wasn't always. And this guy tormented him throughout the year and just chased him and chased him and made him miserable in class, miserable at, at lunch, miserable in recess, his whole life was miserable. And it came to it, it culminated in the eighth grade graduation festivities when his family was around. And he had never told his family because he was embarrassed and he had pride. And he was actually hiding from this guy during the graduation ceremony through one of those dividing screens that divides the room. He was hiding behind it. And it really just took something as simple as his brother looking at him and saying, what are you, what are you doing? You can't live like this. And he said from that moment on, he decided to change everything. His mentality, his mindset, how he's going to build up his body, how he's going to attack school and attack sports and, and do that. He never looked back and he really went on to have a, a great career in California um, for the Bears out there, playing two sports, basketball and football, and of course, Hall of Fame uh, NFL career as well. So um, I think that might have hit home a little bit with some of the middle schoolers. <clears throat> but the point there being that path of progress, you can change at any time. 
And it's up to you to look in the mirror and say, how am I feeling about how, where I am and where I'm headed? And you can change it, get that volition, that power to choose um, at any time. So now we're down to the one, two, four. We're at the four. This is the four, the first step. Um, and it's simple, again, just to find when you class. And we try to get them to, to raise their hand, and, and they really were active in, in raising their hand and, and participating and, and giving winning elements. We try to break it down. What's winning to you? What's class? And try to put it together. They really got it. They, they, here's some of the elements um, that we shared. And they hit on some of these. If they didn't say these exact words, they really got the idea. So, again, what you guys are doing here is, is special, and, and it's clear that your kids get it. Um, so that's very refreshing. Um, so I went through some of the uh, interviews that I did and, and their definitions. You can see, obviously, Tony Dungy was, was an amazing interview. Um, Super Bowl winning coach that got their attention too. Um, but you know, he focuses on you know not just winning, but it's how you do it. And I talked about how he told me that he had a no cussing rule on his team. Um, he was a big believer. In, I'm not going to yell at anybody. I'm not going to humiliate anybody. I'm not going to bear anybody down, but I, you know, raise them up instead and in positive encouragement. I'm not sure there was discipline, there was discipline. Um, but, you know, one of his books is called Quiet Strength, and that just defined, to me, defines him. And it also proves that it can be done as a Super Bowl winning coach and one of the most respected people in the sports world as well. <clears throat> Steve Kerr is another great interview, um, and he focuses his definition on the word respect and how hard it is to win and compete, and he knows that, but then acknowledging that in your opponent. In your opponent. So when you win, it showing some compassion for the other guy who put in just as much hard work as you did. Um, <clears throat> he had an amazing story, which I had never heard. His father was um, a professor uh, from American University over in the Middle East uh, when he was at Arizona playing basketball and uh, actually got shot and killed by a terrorist. Um, during his career. And he, uh, you know, Steve to me always looks like a guy like, looks like this. And he came out the, the first game back he played after that tragedy. I think it was one of their rival student section starts chanting things about his death. But you want to talk about the opposite of winning with class. <clears throat> so what'd you do? And, you know, we've seen athletes freak out today. It's things like that. Gestures back to them or whatever. He said, I, I hit four shots in the half and he shut them up. <laughs> and that was it. So it's another good lesson of let your play do the talking. Um, so then Tracy Wolfson, um, another great interview. She's you know, obviously one of the top uh, broadcast teams for CBS for NFL, sideline reporter. She does, did a good job of, of really emphasizing her definition. By the way, we did 75 to 80 interviews, and I told the kids to, this is truly personal. This proves my point that I'm trying to make this personal to you because I didn't have one repeat definition. I got a definition from everybody, but 10 are supposed to give it to me still. But I didn't have one repeat. So <laughs> common themes overlapping, but everybody sees it a little differently. Um, but they have the common, same common theme. So she focuses on longevity, if being in it for the long haul. And to do that, she's always said, be personal, be true to who you are, and get along with everybody. You'll be fine. Kind of like the same themes we're talking about. Um, and then she emphasizes the fact that she's living her dream and she's going to chase being on the top of her game as a broadcaster, but it's never going to be at the sacrifice of her priorities. Uh, so her family is first and that's how it's going to stay, um, which is a great segue into the second step um, that I had made with the kids is, is establish your priorities. And, you know, we asked them for what their definition of a priority is. And I think the middle school did a great job. Um, a couple of kids right around what's important to you. Uh, what you value. You know, so they did a good job in general describing what a priority is. And then we came up with some other ones, school, family, um, <clears throat> which was right in line with the priorities I got from my interviews, um, pretty much verbatim. So um, they for sure get that. But step three in the, in the four um, is pretty much where they can really put their individuality into this. Um, so looking at each one of their priorities as they list them out, we'll show you how they do that in a second, but um, really digging into where are you in that priority, and where are you headed, and where you want to be, um, and then how do you get there? What are the individual steps to get there? Um, so we talked about that a little bit. We, we massaged it and went into the school element. How can you be a great student? And of course, how to be a great athlete, a better athlete for your coaches, and be a better sibling. You know, some of the kids 
we talked about that. How can you win with class at home? You know, one kid said, well, if you get in a fight with your siblings, you can show compassion. You know, they're, they're really thinking. So it, it wasn't a dead room. These, these, these guys are smart. They're doing a great job. <laughs> um, and then really put put it all together in an action plan that you're going to see periodically, whether it be weekly, monthly. Again, it's up to them how they do it. But what we're after, like I said, is some type of journal that they have where these elements are there for them to correct, pivot, change, adjust as life goes on. But it's a go-to foundational tool that makes them strong from the inside that they can have good, bad, and ugly days and be fine still and still fix up. You know. <clears throat> so here's I, I put it together just an idea for six days, okay, to focus on each element of this one, two, four. Um, and Paul mentions 15 minutes a day or 14 minutes a day, right? Um, so it's right in line with with because I when I start talking about this, I say give me give me 15 or 20 minutes a day. So it's, Amazing how we, we think alike from the get-go. But if you focus on each one of these elements and just write down your thoughts and write down your definitions and write down what you want to see, where you are, the self-awareness and where you want to be. Um, and then at the very bottom, within your priority, that day five, you're putting specific goals in each area and then steps to get there. And then it's up to you on day six to create, well, I'm going to do this every week, Sunday night, I'm going to say, hey, what priority am I going to focus on, you know? Is this, I can do something for my family this week, or I can do something, you know, my parents have done so much to bring me here, here's something I can do to help out the family. Um, here's what I can do extra over and above at school. You know, and, and not only in school, we talked about the legacy, not for them only, but this place, you know. We talked about, you know, what does the level of winning with class do when you walk into a room? And more importantly, the history of this place, will you add to this legacy in a winning with class way or not? Um, so those kind of, kind of questions you, they can ask themselves in each area of their lives. Um, <clears throat> so then we, we talk about, you know, that's obviously going through the one, two, four from top down. Then we go back up and say, hey, if you do all this on the four level and you're winning with class in each area of your life, how about those two questions? How do you think you're going to answer those? Are those going to be the questions that you're positive about, that you feel good about? And we give the three claps. And they all did that. That was pretty good. Um, and if you win with class in every area of your life, which is the four, and you're asking those two questions of yourself, I like what I see in the mirror, I like where I'm heading, what are the chances you're going to be happy with your overall life? Again, three claps for a yes. They were doing that really well. I said, if you have that group, one strong life that you're happy about, is there anything you can't handle, winning or losing? Like we talked about playing offense or defense in life. Now you've got your foundation, your go-to, that's going to allow you to do both and excel. And they got that, they like that pretty well. And I told stories uh, to, to bring on the, the, the power and really here's the why. Why do you want to build such a strong foundation? Valerie Goldman was an amazing interview. She is the coach at Central Washington University as a Division II school. And she also played softball there. And in her senior year, she got all the way to the senior year and never made the NCAA tournament. And she finally got to a game where they were going to, they won, they were going to go. She's playing defense, and the opposing girl batter comes up and hits a home run over the fence. <clears throat> and in rounding in her home run shot, rounding first base, she blows out a knee and goes down. And she's not moving at all. And they really weren't clear on what to do. They, you can YouTube this is a great video to watch, but one thing they did know was that that girl, the batter's teammates, could not help her. Uh, so she was either going to have to get uh, substitute for and then the three runs don't score or something else had to happen. But the one thing wasn't going to happen is her teammates could, could take her around the bases. So that wasn't good enough for Mallory. Mallory's on defense. Without thinking, she went to the umpire and said, I know her teammates can't carry her, but what about us? And she and another teammate from defense grabbed up the girl and they went around each base and touched him. And so she got three run home run. And they end up losing the game and Mallory doesn't go to the NCAA tournament. So you watch the video, and, and before I interviewed her, watching it, obviously, and preparing, and the Mallory's team gets together on the pitcher's mound after that uh, happened, and everyone's crying, the whole stadium's crying. <laughs> and I said, what are you guys talking about on the pitcher's mound? She said, get the next batter. And I thought that was perfect, because we then we talked about making the point with your kids that, you know, this isn't a 50-50 thing of winning with class. In the perfect world, we're in women's class, 50-50 everything we do. Sometimes, you got to focus on winning, and sometimes you got to focus on class. 
And really where the balance is, is never losing either of those elements. So here she wanted to win the game. She was here to win the game. She was here to go to the tournament. But when it came time to think class and put class first, she did it without thinking. And so, well, you know, because this thing went viral. It went crazy. ESPN got all over it. National media extended on her. Um, but it took a little while to happen. I said, what did you do after the game? Thinking she was crazy. So she's like, I went out with my parents and we talked about my career. That was it. But it also showed, too, that that was part of her nature. She had soaked in what she got from her parents and family. So it was just natural. She didn't even think, she didn't think it was a big deal. She went out to dinner. They didn't talk about it. And then just went crazy. I also say to Paul, is there an easier hire for a coach uh, than somebody like that that's got that history, especially for the alma mater? Um, and this, um, you know, I, I told them also, I don't have favorites. If anybody ever asked me what favorite interview, um, but if one was to, to display, um, be why, of why you build such a foundation, this would be it. Um, <clears throat> This happened in Charleston, South Carolina. He was, this is a sophomore, Chris Singleton, um, you may know his story, but um, he was a sophomore for Charleston Southern, uh, the out, an outfielder on the baseball team back in 2015. His mom was one of the nine shot and killed at the church shooting uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. And we have family down there. <clears throat> My niece was getting married the, that week later. And so we didn't know what was going to happen. The whole country's up in arms. and. Um, it's really volatile. Everybody's ascending down Charleston. But we went down there, and um, I'm in the hotel treadmill trying to stay in shape. And I see the local news, and it's this guy walking up to the podium in the middle of his baseball field, less than 24 hours after his mom was shot and killed. <clears throat> and he said two things. He said, "Love is stronger than hate," and we've already forgiven this guy, this year, which was just blew me away. Like, I became a little, when I was in this interview process, I became a little obsessive. And I was just, I have to have that guy. So um, it took a long while. His department, athletic department, right, so protected him and guarded him because very sensitive. Um, but once I kept knocking respectfully, uh, they finally said, okay, here's the email address. And we got in contact. And his first comment to me was, Mr. Macbeth, I'll do the interview, but I don't want to talk about that night you know, when I lost my mom. And I said, that's great because I don't even, I want to talk about, how you had the wherewithal to say what you said on that podium. He said, okay, so we did the interview. And it was one of the best interviews I've ever done. Um, he said, I had no idea what I was going to say when I walked up to that podium. Uh, it just came out. And that was one of my main points with the kids was, this is why you build things starting right now. So that when you're on auto, autopilot, when life punches you in the face, this, this good stuff comes out. And he had a lot of things happen to him individually. Um, during that, he, uh, President Obama came down and saw him. Uh, Cam Newton brought him to an NFL box for a playoff game. He threw out an opening pitch for the Yankees, and he was on the Today Show, et cetera, et cetera, just kept going. <clears throat> and he said, that's all great, and those are all nice people, but the most important thing that happened to me was a fifth grader wrote me a letter and called me his hero. Um, and I was like, great. He was always one step ahead of me, this 20-year-old. Uh, he's been through this tragedy. He said, but as soon as I got called a hero, I knew there was a responsibility that came with that. And that's exactly what he's done ever since. He has gone on, he gave baseball a shot, and really was watching him for a little bit. He went all the way through the AAA system for the Cubs, uh, but then transitioned out of that. And now he's his, his own author, and he speaks to kids and has children's books out, and uh, just a great role model. But again, I told the kids, you know, he told me, I didn't want to go to church every Sunday. I didn't want to do the things and listen to my mom when she was lecturing me about principles and priorities. But I never shut her out either. I soaked it in. And when she was yelling and obnoxious on the sideline in a positive way, at every one of my Little League games, I was appreciating that. I was thankful for that. And those are the types of things. <laughs> we have one out there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's great. But that's great. But he soaked it all in. And this is what happened. Um, and they really bothered me about that. Um, and then, of course, from my proceeds from the book, we'll go to this organization called Alex's Lemonade Stamp Foundation. Um, they fight along with pediatric facilities across the country. They fight childhood cancer and help families across the country um, with their medications and travel and all that stuff. And um, the founder was Alex Scott, who was only with us for eight years. Um, <clears throat> she was diagnosed literally on her first birthday with neuroblastoma which is an aggressive form of childhood cancer. And 
So literally spent seven or eight years fighting it. And right around age four, she started thinking, well, I'm meeting a lot of kids. I'm exposed to all these kids, going to different centers for treatment. I'm going to start a lemonade stand and I'm going to start raising money. And she didn't say anything, but she just started to her parents or anything like that. She just started having a little neighborhood lemonade stand. And it took off and got a little popular in the neighborhood and local news thought it was cool. So they would come down a little bit. Um, then it started growing a little bit. Her mom said, okay, what, what, what's this all about? She thought she was saving some up for, to buy something. And so she asked Alex from about the age of four, what, what's going on? What, what's your plan? And she's like, well, this money isn't for me. This is for my friends. So this is my, your friends. Yeah, my friends that are fighting with cancer as well. So I made that point to the kids too. You know, you talk about winning life with class. She's fighting her battle to do everything she can to survive and win. And she's thinking about other people and thinking about them first and spending her time first. Um, and she said, yeah, she's like, I want to raise a million dollars. And her mom told me that. I thought that was cute, but you know, I said to her, I said, you know, you're, you're selling 50 cent cups of lemonade, that's going to be hard. You know, just get ready. And this four year old looked down at the ground and said, um, looked back at her mom and said, I don't care, I'll do it anyways. And that's the point I made to the kids was, you know, you can be told a lot of things, but you say, I'm going to do this one, two, four, I'm going to win with class and everything I do. You're going to hear it's corny, it's cheesy, it's what do you want? You're soft or you're not, you know, you're not competitive, you don't have driven, whatever. You gotta look yourself in the mirror and do what Alex did and say, I don't care, I'll do it anyway. Because it worked out pretty well. Alex, on the day before she died, she found out she raised her million dollar and hit her goal. And then her family took this foundation and has raised over 200 million. Um, so it's just amazing things can happen from these foundations that you have and thinking, winning the class and thinking, not just me, helping my team out as, as well. Um, and that was it. Um, really left them with the question. Um, what's your one, two, four? Um, and that, that's how I left them. And, and, you know, I think it really was amazing the eye contact they had. I thought, um, we had a good, we had a time pretty good. We didn't lose them or make it too long. But, um, as parents, I think you're probably all doing a lot of this. Um, one of the main reasons I'm doing this is because, um, you, know, you hear about all these problems that are happening with anxiety, depression, isolation with the pandemic didn't help at all. Um, I don't know if you guys are experiencing that as well or not, but um, you know, I, th I think um, you guys are clearly doing a lot of this stuff too, um, because it was clear to me to see the kids, to see the staff, see this community um, that's being done, but um, clearly they need you to do that part where they live it, right? Because you guys are the home and you're the home base. Um, so if you acknowledge them doing it, maybe you can do it together. Paul and I are going to stay in touch and, and work on possibly being a pilot uh, group on, when we work together on things and have focus groups. And um, I would love to have anybody's contributions uh, to that as well. Um, but that's it in a nutshell. Um, and that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. You good for any questions? I am. If we I am. It up for a little yeah. bit, a um, little question yeah. and answer session. So anything with this presentation, um, or in general about his process of writing the book and interviewing his board professionals, but open it up to, to our adults. Or what are you? Are you guys seeing that? Um, yeah, I asked. You know, when I talk about playing defense in life, so what are the things you're struggling with? And, one kid said friendships, one kid said relationships, and one kid. So I don't know if social media is always a, a, a challenge for you guys. And I'm sure that's true, correct? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and we talked about that. You know, one of the reasons it's so important to have your own thing is because you get to block all that noise out, stop comparing yourself to others. You know, social media is, it goes so far as to calling it a lie, what people project out there. This is my perfect world. And I have it, you don't. And sometimes that comes across to people when they look at it. So, yeah. The example you gave was of, of, of the kid that was really hid behind the board. Right? Yeah. How does a program like this help bring that kid out earlier? Because I've heard this story 20 times about middle school students that bullied for the four or four years. They never tell anybody where they were friends. How do you get kids to bring that to people so they don't know? Whether it's parents, teachers, whatever. Yeah, and I think that's the key part is. Um, creating for them some comfort zone, wherever that is. And if, you know, you got a great start with the staff here, and then if you do it at home, you know, I, I think that's where the positive reinforcement being your main message is. Um, 
because to your point, it's like, I mean, it, to get boys to talk, period. Um, and then you got one that's tormented. Uh, it's brutal. I get it. But, you know, I talked to the sports psychologist and, and we got into it a little bit, but not specifically on that issue, but it's all about self-esteem and, and making themselves like who they are. Um, and then having a path of progress for hope for the future. So, you know, make them feel as good as they can about themselves. So you're celebrating those wins. Um, and that doesn't rule out discipline. That doesn't rule out tough love um, because it, there is a balance there. Um, but anything we can do to build their confidence and then keep asking them. That'd be my answer. In your interviews with athletes, did you come across anyone who said, I had a problem with being over angry and emotional during games when I was younger, and I found some sort of way to overcome that, but that I grew out of it or I found a way to mature and not act, um, you know, have this red rage. Come yeah, out <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, I did. Jason Day comes to mind, uh, the golfer, um, and he, he really did. The story how he bridged the gap uh, isn't a great one. It's not filled with a lot of meat on it. Um, I remember him telling me that his longtime caddy that he just broke up with, but um, his longtime caddy was his teacher. And he had, I think his dad died early in his life and led him to alcohol and fighting and being obnoxious and being just the worst attitude you can have. And I remember his story to me was this coach said, we're going to go play nine holes with Jason said, no, I'm not. <laughs> you know, you've probably never seen that, but he said, I don't want to play nine holes, I'm playing 18 or whatever. And said, fine, and he kind of kicked him off. And Jason went away there. His mom had sent him to a special private place and collected all her money and really put him up. And he said he went off on his own and had a few hours by himself and just figured, I'm at a fork in the road. I either straighten myself up and get humble right now, or it's over. Um, so I don't know what his magic pill was. Um, but I think it was that wake up call, like I got a chance to do something great or I can trash everything. Um, and he saw that vision and his coach was obviously like a father figure to him too, because they were together forever. Um, but I think that's part of it for sure. Yep. Um, I'm trying to see how I want to award this. Uh, I was the fifth class of boys to graduate from here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Started in 91, excuse me. And uh, we had a lot of losing. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so my last soccer game as a freshman, we lost 17 to nothing to Athens. <laughs> and my last senior at basketball, we were 1 in 17 in basketball. So okay. lots of losing. And so you didn't have a choice but to lose your class, yep. if you will. Yep. Because it was just the fact that you got to participate. Back then, there were 100 in the high school, 30 boys, 70 girls. Yeah. So it was a very good uh, ratio. And <laughs> the, uh, but back then, if you had a pulse, you were on the team. Okay. You know, okay. it's like, oh, your boy got a pulse, you're on the team. Right. And right. so with that, but so we, you know, we, as I say, a lot of the sports did not do very well. So you had to accept that losing was probably going to happen. Sure. And not everybody can be a rock star at yeah. everything. So right. you have something like this, and then you compare it to the unfortunate, everybody gets a trophy generation. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. do you separate the two? You want to build them the confidence. You want to make them feel good. Mm -hmm. But so many kids, they're just not everybody is going to be an NBA player. Not everybody's going to be a Division One tennis player. Not everybody's going to be right. but they are made to feel that they are, which is setting them up to fail. Absolutely. So yeah. how do you, what's the delicate balance between doing what you're saying yeah. and not, okay, well, let's give them a, you're 0-17, but you get a trophy because you're a good guy. Yeah, which I am as much against as I am the win at all costs, right? Mm -hmm. It is that middle place. And you talk about the, the constant losing. If you do my coaching record from Little League or basketball, oh my God. I, I had a friend that was an athletic director and they were hired basketball coach. He said, don't send me your resume. <laughs> um, but I think you have to focus on little wins, right? Here's what we got better on. And, and yeah, we lost the game, but our turnovers are way down, right? Our rebounds are way up. Um, our steals are, you know, you got you to gotta somehow build their character, which you're supposed to get from losing. Um, we have a lot of character. Yeah, right, thanks. I, I, I was preaching character when I was losing. But, um, yeah, I think it's just a balance. I think it comes down to um, a lot of things, the parents and the coaches in, in sending that message. I mean, I, 
Dick Vitale, who just he just posts he posts a motivational minute every every day, I think. And he talked about a um, school out of California, a football school that just beat somebody 106 to nothing, and they went for two to get 106. So they had 104, but they went for two. And it's just that stuff I thought was fading, and maybe it'll just always be around, and, and, and maybe we'll, we'll just all, always have jerks. Um, that's not giving in, but I think that's the important of this stuff, the important part of this stuff, and the reason why we do this stuff, and we just got to spread the word as far and wide as possible. Um, because it was club sports taking over and that all the politics involved in that and the cutthroat level there. Um, and like you said, the other extreme is everybody gets a trophy. And then, life is cutthroat. Thank you, Brian. Exactly. I mean, it's exactly. just, that's the reality. It is. And so, it is. you know, and everybody as parents are just yep. like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Which yeah. is great, but when you get to a lifetime, you say, it's okay, we have fired. Right. So, it's right. that. Right. I had a, a radio interview with um, an ESPN affiliate New Mexico once, and he said, winning with class, winning with class, I think sports will show. And I said, that's part of it. But the first word is winning. So you, you have to do your best. You have to aim to win. Um, and that's not a bad thing, right? It's just, like I said, it's a swinging pendulum thing where you got to find the times. To, it's not 50-50, but you can never dismiss class and pursue the winning, but you can never dismiss the winning either. Um, and that's the everybody gets a trophy. So we got to get that word out. <laughs> As far as possible, it's a challenge. I know. Um, so, how do you? I mean, what is, I, what is the advice? But like, let's say you're spending all of your time as a teammate and a coach, winning the class, doing this, and you're losing, and you're losing against someone who is not doing it. I mean, that's clearly a teacher. That's frustrating, right? right? But that is hard to then say, like. Look! Look at you guys. Yeah, right. You know, one, two, four. Right. <laughs> so I know. Like, yeah. I know, and it's so hard to tell a teenager um, what do you want your life to look like when you're ninety, right? Because they, they don't, they're not going to think about it. Um, but you know, Candace Parker said, you know, in not only did she say to me what she said, but I watched her press conference after she just won, and she's like, I think time defines you, and I think that's a great message. She's like, I'm just going to keep my head down because. She's gotten written off over the last several years. Um, and then she's made a comeback, being a defensive player of the year in the last couple of years and winning a championship. But people wrote her off. And, um, in fact, she, her peers voted her the most overrated player in the last couple of years. Somebody did. And so she's got, she had a, a reason to be a little bitter, a chip on her shoulder. But she looked the reporters in the eye and she was emotional after this win. And she said, I just put my head down and keep, keep doing what I'm doing and doing me. And I think time will define me. If I do that, and I know that's that's easy, easier said than done in conveying that to a kid. Um, but if we just, and you guys are role models, right? You guys can say, "This is the way we lived our lives. This is this is what you can have as a family if you keep winning like this in life." Um, I think that's all we can do. So, I would just throw out the suggestion that yeah. is the concept of competing, uh -huh. um, because I think. The more that we stress to our young people and our adults that you go out there and compete and right. do your best. Right. Because even in the classroom, you know, forget sports, in the classroom, you're competing every day to yep. do your best, to yep. get your best, you know, whatever that is. That's brave, that's just, you know. And, and, and I also would suggest that I think the whole, you know, everybody gets a trophy thing, that's not the kids' fault. That's, right. that's right. the adults' fault. They, right. We have set that tone. Agreed. And that can change yeah. by saying, you know what, everybody don't get a trophy, but every parent wants their kid to have a trophy, which in the short term might be good, but long term, to your points, are you really helping them or hurting them? You know? Right. And, and to your point, if you come out with that message, hey, we're going to be the first practice, and the parents are sitting around, you say, we're going to compete, and everybody on here is going to compete for a spot or whatever. To your point, some of the parents are probably going to come up to you afterwards and say, wait a minute, that's a little harsh. And we got to just, I guess it's the messaging, right? The compete doesn't mean cutthroat. The compete doesn't mean at all costs. We're going to maintain the class element, but this is a sport. We're going to play to win. Period. Uh, I mean, the school competes for being the top high right. school in the state. You know, and, and compete, so we to your point, life is competition. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's a great message. Right. Um, but those 106 to nothing guys don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but neither do the guys that give out trophies for nothing. <laughs> What, uh, 
parents think as it goes. What do you tell the parents if somebody is wanting that sort of thing? I mean, you, especially you got that mentality out of the example. I think you have a discussion about why they're playing sports. You know, I mean, sports can do so much great for your child. But if we pamper them throughout the process, they're not going to get from sports what they're supposed to get. You know, character is half of it, more than it, if not more. And you learn that from losing and not getting the trophy and how you respond and how you grow. Um, I think that's a conversation we have to have. Um, and then the coach just has to be strong about it. I'm never going to beat anybody 106 to nothing, but I'm also going to play to win every game. <laughs> you know. It's tough. We're living in a tough time, for sure. Challenge. <clears throat> All right. Another round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Um, and I've said this now in my three years as athletic director. I think the a healthy athletic um, department or program is an extension of the school day. And so what we try to do, what we aim to do, is educate um, and and allow our kids to learn through sport. Um, and so this was part of that today. Um, while yes, his message was definitely tied with athletics, I, I think it also is, is the bigger picture of how do you win in life um, and how do you win with class of life. So thank you so much, Mr. Thank you so much. And thank you guys all for coming out tonight. Thank I really you appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.